three biggest travel times of the year, and most airlines, big or small, are book solid. Tonight, Mike Dunn is standing by live at the Salisbury Wicomico Airport with more on the holiday travel rush. Mike, is Henson Airlines getting its share of travelers? Yes, Mark, they certainly are. As a matter of fact, we spoke with Henson Airlines President Don Smith earlier today, and he said this is the big, busiest Thanksgiving in the company's history. Evidence of just how busy the airline is could be seen earlier today, as two full Henson flights arrived within minutes of one another here in Salisbury. I think you have to go back farther than just the dash. You have to look at the progression in aircraft types going back into the 70s. From 1982 or three earlier, regionals had always had small airplanes. The Beach 99, which was a 15 passenger, very uncomfortable, uh, pretty much first generation turboprop. And then the improvement on that was the Shorts 330, where passengers could stand up. And that was really a box with the wing over the top, but it was unpressurized, so you couldn't go above 10,000 feet, which meant you spent a lot of time in the weather. They were always just on the edges of the airline business, and then came along deregulation, when basically anybody could fly anywhere, and it was so inexpensive to do it with a, with a regional airline. The only problem was, at the time, they had no new airplanes. And along comes the Dash 8, which hit it right when the market blew open. And that provided the, the, the funding and the financial stability to start buying the Dash 8. And the Dash 8 was the, the cream of the crop in terms of turboprops. It was faster than the Dash 7. It had some of the short takeoff and landing characteristics. But it was really a very nice turboprop. And there were other turboprops that competed with the Dash, but really nothing of the quality of the Dash. And the quality of the product was always very important to Dick Henson. You know, he had been a businessman for many, many years, going back to, uh, you know, when, in his 20s when he started his, his first business. And so being profitable was important, but that was never the driver with him. The driver with him was the quality of the product and really the reputation that he had in whatever business he was in. I never uh, expanded to make money necessarily. Money seemed to, if you build a better mousetrap, uh, the, the funds will, will be there and you will make a profit. He was a test pilot for 30 years with Fairchild Aircraft, so he had a real understanding, more so than most airline guys, even though most of them were pilots, of how an aircraft was built and what was important in the construction of an aircraft. The name Dick Henson, of course, to all us uh, aviation lovers is certainly not a new one. Well, I know well, you've been with this outfit uh, a few weeks anyway. Yes, I have. Uh, that's quite nice of you to say that. Uh, I've been here almost we're all excited years. about the Dash 8. Uh, brand new Dash 8, uh, we were going to be one of the first customers. I was here when Mr. Henson brought the first Dash 8 into Salisbury and he had quite a bit of fanfare with it and he showed everybody he could fly it. <laughs> they all called and said, you know, what time the airplane would probably be here with Mr. Henson and Lou DeWeese. He uh, did a low pass, he, he had his gear up, flaps were up. Engines seem to be, you know, full bore, which is kind of what we expected. But what we didn't expect was whenever he got right in front of the crowd, he just pulled that airplane and it just went almost straight up. And of course, we were all sucking wind, you know. <laughs> I thought he was going to go into orbit or one of those engines was just going to give out. And then he did one maneuver where he went straight up in the air and just let it hang down and just kind of like fall. And then he just took off straight. But it was... Man, it was incredible to see him do those type of maneuvers, and it was a fast aircraft. When they did land, uh, Mr. Henson got out, and he had the biggest smile on his face. He just walked down, and you know he was waving to everybody, and had a big smile on his face. And but when the the Haviland test pilots who were riding with him got out, they were about white as a sheet. Well, I think he was demonstrating what Mr. Henson could do, but yet yeah, also too what the Dash could do as well. It was the cutting edge premier airplane out there. Yeah. For regionals, it was a whole new level of regional service. American 876, you'll be number uh, six or seven for departure now, depending on how we go. We had one of the first Dash 8s, and we became very proficient at maintaining it. On the maintenance side, there was a lot of things, starting with Mr. Henson. I mean, he, before we even took the, the Dash 8, he's the one that 
kind of fix the cargo compartment baggage restraint system. It took, I don't know, 15, 20 steps to close the baggage door before we got the airplane. And then he you know, huddled up with the engineers and said, you know, look, we got to do something. He loved being ahead of everybody else. And he was ahead of, of every other regional carrier out there with, with these, uh, this equipment. He made sure the uh, aircraft had an APU on it, which was something new to, to us and to the industry. Every piece on that aircraft has written information on it on how to install. The maintenance just blows your mind, you know, and these guys are great. I will say it was a comfortable feeling working on the same piece of equipment for 30 plus years. Uh, it's kind of like having an old car or truck in your yard that you know when you put up the hood what it's going to look like. Yeah, I guess it went through a cycle. Obviously, right at first, it was a lot of teething problems, like I said, but uh, after we did a lot of modifications, learned more about the aircraft, everything went pretty well. And of course, then it started to age, and then we started to get into the aging type issues, and, and we tackled those also. A lot of that stuff you do, it's the first time, you know, nobody else would. Done it. When I first started, it was, here's the part, go put it on the airplane. <laughs> there wasn't much troubleshooting involved when I first started. Yeah, I get to make all the parts around here, too, if we need something made. Parts were very scarce. We were very lucky over the years to have a lot of young guys that were, that were just naturally good fabricators. I guess that's so purchasing folks who know all the nooks and crannies of where some of these older aircraft are stored and and they can um, salvage some parts off of those, have them inspected. I don't know if I made thousands, but I made hundreds of parts. I think the last part I, that I spent a lot of time making on was the flight attendant seat supports. There was, I forget, like almost a year lead time and there were $32,000 a piece. And I, I think I made them for whatever, you know, just I think it took me like 10 hours to make one. The whole prop system, propeller system, control system is, is actually more complicated then uh, in the engine control system is, is more complicated than a, than a jet. You know, jet's fairly simple operation. Whereas the props, you know, you got a lot of things that could go wrong and you have to guard against those types of things. So it, it therefore it builds complexity into the system and it's sometimes pretty difficult to troubleshoot those types of things, the auto feather and beta lock out and those types of things, so flying into Syracuse and it was uh, snowing and apparently icing and it was uh, funny how the aircraft and it was just a regular thing the ice would hit the side of the aircraft but however the mechanism worked it would the plane would have to start to shake to vibrate the ice off and of course I called the captain and said well, what's going on with this he goes oh that's just something that the aircraft does to get rid of the ice it's all right of course the other passengers looking at my face and I'm like I feel like the dash is a tank a tank that can take care of you if anything happens. There's not another airplane I'd rather be in, in weather, than the dash. It's like a tank. This is going to sound weird, but I loved that it was noisy. Um, I loved the turbulence. I know that sounds weird, but I did. I never wanted to be on anything else, so I was glad. That's one of the main reasons I came here. Um, I had opportunities to go to other airlines, but I had no, um, no desire to work on a different kind of plane. Every time, right after takeoff, and I'm on a prop airplane, I just kind of fall right to sleep. You know, it puts me right to sleep. So, so I kind of like it that way. <laughs> the turbulence and the noise made me tired. It did. I can fall asleep on a dash like that. That's the only drawback to the dash noise. You know, uh, it, it's very, very loud. Um, and, and a lot of people, a lot of customers complain about that. In many ways, in terms of electronics and the systems ahead of its time, compared to the other other turboprops, and then you have to remember that not only did we have the the 100s, at one time we had a fleet of almost 20 Model 200s, which were a big improvement, a more powerful engine, a better air conditioning system, same number of passengers, but a much faster airplane, and we had a fleet of 200s that we we flew in Florida uh, that were very very successful. And then, of course, the 300, which was the 50-passenger version, but using the same engine that the 200 had. So if you looked at the three models in terms of speed, the 137 seats was the slowest. The 200, same number of seats, was the fastest. And the 300 with, 30, with 50 seats was in the middle in terms of speed. 
short runways, and the best example of that was Hilton Head. We cornered the market and really had a monopoly from Charlotte to Hilton Head for many, many years because of the short runway there. And the, uh, the regional jets couldn't operate there with, with any uh, passenger load. So they're a real advantage for, for short haul markets. It's very nostalgic. When people think of Dash 8s, they think of Hilton Head Island. They liked it almost like the Dash was like their own private plane feeling type. I hear that all the time. It's like, oh, I feel like I, and I'm, I'm flying on an island in a private plane. Going into, let's say, Hilton Head, that's very challenging because it's a very small runway, trees everywhere, always a crosswind. And if you can do it, in, if you can do it in the dash, it you can do it with anything. No matter how small that we airport we are, um, the dashes always came through and brought our passengers safely in and out. And the thing about a Dash 8, you could almost load it by yourself because you didn't need a belt loader unless you had something really heavy, but you could really load it yourself and you could jump in it in the cargo bin with, with ease. So that was a fun aircraft to work, easy aircraft to work, uh, exciting. You always had to keep in the back of your mind the, the props. You know, once the props are turning, you know, a certain speed, you can't tell that it's, that's there, especially during nighttime, you know. That was, a, that was a big challenge. Dash 8 was built, built in Canada and poor Canadian type terrain, I think, and Canadian weather, unfortunately, because it's not too, too good when it gets warm, but <laughs> it's very good when it gets cold. I've never really had any bad experience on the Dash. Um, it did get a little hot in summer, but I just kept putting it in my mind to, okay, I'm going to lose weight, I'm going to lose weight, that's fine, that's fine. If the air conditioning worked better in it, <laughs> I would have nothing at all bad to say about the airplane. You might as well open the refrigerator door in the back of it. And that's about what you're getting as far as air conditioning goes. It, if it wasn't for the air conditioning, it would be a perfect airplane. I flew the Dash for about 15 years, and there's things you can do in a Dash 8, in a transport category airplane, that you can't do in any other airplane. With passengers, in a normal environment, without, the, without that ability, Philadelphia would be seriously clogged up because of the arrival rates and things like that, which I'm sure they're missing the airplane now. Um, Fast, low, as fast as anyone else, almost, to close in, very slow over the numbers, 85, 90 knots. You know, you could just, you could fit the airplane into the system. And, and the good controllers would know that. And DCA, for example, was fantastic. They'd always fit you in and make things work. It was, it was just a perfect airplane uh, for that type of, what we did with it, the routes we flew with it, it was perfect. We were on our way to 72, but some of those deliveries were, were stopped after 9-11 because the, you know, the industry was just absolutely rocked by 9-11. There were many times where we would uh, look like we weren't gonna make it to the end of the year. I mean, literally, we were gonna have to, we were gonna have to leave, leave. So, and that made it tough. You know, you didn't know whether you're going to come in and we, you know, you're going to have to roll your toolbox out. But then after so many years, you just laughed every time somebody would talk about it because of all the things we went through, nothing seemed to take us down. They tried, yeah, but we stayed afloat. The, the time of, of um, the layoffs was a difficult time here. Um, but I, again, I think because of the reliability of the Dash 8s and the reputation of this regional airline. I think that's what held us here. From what I've heard, except for a short period during the actual bankruptcy and after 9-11, we as a company were always cash positive. And that's mostly due to the Dash 8. The Dash is just something that grows on you. And people say you either love it or hate it. I loved it. So it was kind of, they're like my little baby. And I, I would name some of them, I'm like, oh, that's my baby. Everyone has their favorite dash. They see the number, they're like, oh, that's my favorite one. They always do, it never fails. It's funny how they were all the same but different, kind of like your kids. Someone would say something about it and it was like they were talking about your child. <laughs> You're like, don't say that. Only I can say that about the dash, you can't. You grew accustomed to one may have a dimmer lights in the cabin, one may land differently than others. And there would always be something kind of weird that would happen. You're like, oh, that's just 336. <laughs> and that's um, just, they were like people. I don't know how else to describe it. It's kind of weird, but once you're on there for 10 years, you know, you really, it really becomes home. You spend so much time on, on a plane. It really is like your space.
We did have one that uh, it was um, the Sabre number on the, on the nose of the aircraft was ERL. And people got uh, people started calling it uh, Earl. You know, and, and Earl's coming in, guys. Earl coming in, guys. Well, 906, of course, is you know, it's my favorite. Uh, first one we saw fly in here. For some reason, it sticks in my mind. 914, I always liked. I don't know why. And then there was 908. <laughs> <laughs> 908, which was the manager's plane, we always said, because the Havilland was on a strike, so management built the airplane. And I had the good fortune, or misfortune, to go up and pick it up, but it was nothing but headaches because management put it together. You cannot believe all of the problems. And that's one of those airplanes, when you're walking across the ramp that you've been swapped into, you go, oh no. You just don't know what kind of fun things are going to happen. As you go through all the ground school, they tell you, well, you flip this switch and it turns that on, and you get in the airplane, you flip that switch and it turns that off <laughs> because they had rigged it, they put the switch in backwards, you know, and you just went through this whole process of over a couple of weeks finding every little thing and writing them up and then getting fixed. But eventually, I, I liked the airplane, like I said, eventually, once we got everything <laughs> straightened out on it, because it was, it was the actual first dash I ever set foot in. Yeah, you could throw a switch and, did I just hear the lab flush? Exactly, <laughs> exactly. The propellers are always like, I don't know if I'm going to be okay on this propeller plane. And they're like, you'll be fine. <laughs> you know? so, but it's amazing that the people want to touch the propellers. That's, that's the crazy thing. They always want to reach up and, and walk over there. You have the gate agents going, no, 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 no. It's, and so, um, I don't know, I guess it's human nature. The first time you see the response is when you see the passengers coming and they're walking out to the plane. It's, as soon as they see, they're looking around like, okay, that, that can't be it. That's not what I'm supposed to be getting on. Um, they get on, they ask weird questions. Um, are we gonna get there? Yes, we're gonna get there. Um, what's that noise? I said, it's okay, it's, you know. And um, for a long period of time, we did a single engine taxi to save on fuel. That scared people. Back and forth, back and forth. Why is there only one working? It's a mix. You know, there's some people that love it. They're frequent flyers, like, I'm so happy to be on a dash. And then there's other people just, they're just, no, no way, not this one. Especially when they're the first time flyer ever. And of course, the first plane they get on is a dash. You just need to um, put them at ease and they're okay. And then when they sit down, we start hitting a little bump. We hit another bump. I always would joke if they were somewhere near me, don't leave fingernail marks in that armrest. Right after Sully landed in the Hudson, I had um, actually had a celebrity on board and his bodyguard. His bodyguard was deathly afraid of flying. And he was a big, big man, and of course he sat right in front of me, and he is white knuckling the seat, and I asked if he was okay. And then he saw something that said U.S. Airways on it. He's like, oh, this is U.S. Airways. We can land in the Hudson. I said, but that's not going to happen. Yeah, I've met a lot of celebrities through here. I've had uh, Woody Harrelson, uh, Boy George. I've met John Legend. Pro wrestlers like Andre the Giant. Helen Hunt. Ron Howard was on one time. LL Cool J. He wasn't on my flight, but I saw him in Philly. He was going to another dash, actually. I think one of the better ones, too, was Bill Paxton, who since has passed away also. But he, he, he talked to me, sat in front of me, and talked the, most of the flight. Famous people. I had Henry Winkler on my flight. I still remember. It was from Philadelphia to Ithaca. And I saw him in the, um, in the boarding area. And I looked at my phone. And I was like, I think that's Henry Winkler. And he's like, who? And I was like, the five. My first officer, Dale Linton, says, well, I got one. And we said, well, what's yours? And he said, well, not too long ago, I had my birthday and I was flying with Jim Moore. We came to Baltimore up to uh, Westchester County. And I said, you know, we let the people off and I was finishing up my log book. And he said, when I walked out of the cockpit, there standing in front of me was Diana Ross, who broke out into Happy Birthday Dale. The flight attendant knew she was on and set her up for it and she was willing to do it. We all just looked at him and went, we got nothing. <laughs> I mean, I had a captain call in and tell me that his airplane was flying slower than other ones in the fleet by four knots, and he figured it was because he was flying through rain that morning, and he was dead serious. So uh, we do have our calls that <laughs> we all giggle about. We get surprised all the time. Why, how in the heck does somebody do that? I want to say it was Middletown to Philly, where we had to fly with gear down, and we uh, depressurized, but I didn't know that. Uh, we were fairing. So I was sitting in row nine with my earbuds in because I had no passengers and you know they were flying with the flight deck door open because I got no passengers and they hit the call 
button and I, I looked up and they had their masks on. These guys were jokesters though, so I was like, oh, haha, -ha, yeah. They dinged me again. I looked up and they're waiting for me to come up. So I came up to the front. I'm like, what is it? And they said, do you need the mask? I said, for what? And they said, we depressurized. I said, oh, no. I said, I was wondering why I had a headache. I thought it was because I was hungry. And they're like, no. It was, uh, it happened to Doug Zafino, who is a great friend of mine. He's since retired. He says they're en route and he gets this frantic call from the flight attendant that there is an alligator loose in the airplane. And he's like, what are you kidding? And she's like, no, there's an alligator. It's running back and forth. And, and he thinks she's kidding. And she finally convinces him, no, there really is. And so they, <laughs> there's some commotion going on back there. It finally settles down a little bit. The flight attendant gets back to him and says, well, it wasn't an alligator. It was an iguana that got loose. And he's like, an iguana, how did, who got brought an iguana on the airplane? How many road trips have I been on? I don't know, morning shake stick at, I guess. I thought one of the interesting things we did, we, we went down on that job, we, we assessed the engine, it was fine, so we just, we put a new propeller on it. We took an engine with us and trying to figure out how to get it back, so we took out a bunch of seats in the back, stuck it in the back, strapped it down, and we all flew back with the engine in the middle of the airplane. Yeah, we pulled the seats out and piled them up in the back, took the bulkhead down, stuck the engine in the back of the airplane and pushed it up towards the middle, flew back. Row nine. Row nine definitely was the uh, bunk beds of the, you know, when you were on a road trip, it was who was going to get row nine to sleep. I loved row nine because when we had long sits, if I didn't have to go in the airport, I didn't. I would kind of lay across row nine and, you know, rest, take my nap or just hang out. When row nine's full, that's different. It's a little hard. Have I found people in row nine? You know, over the years, anybody that worked for me didn't go in row nine because I knew where they were at and what they were doing. They didn't have time to go back there. I've had people fall asleep in row nine, and they have no idea that everyone else is deplaned until I do my final walkthrough. Flying in the dash, which is sort of a a work-intensive airplane. Uh, it requires your attention quite a bit, and flying in the airspace here, it's it's fun. It's a little bit challenging at first, but it's really fun. Yeah, the dash is a lot of fun. It's one of the most enjoyable planes I've flown so far. Uh, you know, I think it's just being a part of a kind of a special, everyone flying kind of a special airplane. And an airplane that you, as a pilot, you know that it will it will show you your weaknesses, and you can do things with the airplane that if you've got the skill, which Piedmont pilots do because you prove it all the time, um, that it will do things that no other airplane could do. Transport category, none. You could fly the autopilot, and it was a great autopilot, but if you had to disconnect the airplane, you could fly the airplane and make it do things that the autopilot couldn't. But also it would show if you had a weakness in some area, um, you had to fly it. It's a, it's a pilot's airplane. Especially with, with the stuff that we did with the airplane. Coming into Salisbury or non-towered airports, doing full approaches, things like that, they weren't automated. So with the, the big airliners and stuff like that can do all these automated approaches that actually they can't do any of the stuff we could, circling and things like that, um, that it, you know, you, your skills had to, be, had to be pretty sharp. I think everybody mentors everyone. As long as you're willing to learn, they're more than happy to help you. The really senior guys that you'll fly with, uh, they've flown a lot of different airplanes. They've had a lot of airline experience, you know, here or maybe a few other airlines too. The atmosphere is a great company and everybody you work with is like your family away from home. So it's really pretty nice. I got a phone call from Steve Kiefer and Pike. He said, listen, we have a special assignment for you if, if you can go today. I'm like, yeah, I mean, well, obviously, what is it? Because this is the most secretive thing on the property of Piedmont right now. It was, I believe, Mr. Isom that said to Lyle when they were looking at things that they could do for Steve for his retirement, hey, uh, Steve's always been bugging me about a paint scheme. I think it's the paint job that everybody wanted to see on the airplane. We all wanted this paint scheme and it never happened. Whenever 837 was in the line of airplanes to be painted, I was like, that, that would really kind of be the perfect airplane because it, it was really supposed to be way back when an original Henson delivery, it got changed to be Allegheny's first delivery. And even the, the paint guys were like, you, you've got to see this airplane. It's absolutely fantastic. They were thrilled 
with the with the paint job. The timing of it landing in Salisbury was supposed to be pretty much right at at dark or after dark, uh, so that uh, we could get it landed and in the hangar here, and then wrap it up here so other people wouldn't take pictures of it. Trying to keep the secret, covering covering the uniqueness of the airplane. It's beautiful, very touchy. I think it's fabulous. Couldn't look for a better tribute to a wonderful, wonderful CEO. Bill and his wife Ruth Ann and Donna and I walked over and we walked through Hangar 1 and when we got to Hangar 2 and went through the, the, the tunnel between the, the two hangars, there was a, a tarp hanging down. I thought, what in the world is this tarp here for? So we walked around the tarp and the first thing I saw was the dash in the old Piedmont livery, which I had tried for years and years to get. And then I saw that there must have been 100 or 150 people in the hangar, and I just, it just, I don't think, even thinking about it today. Oh my goodness gracious. Oh! Oh! Your first thought is, how do I get this screwed? Well, you know, change it now, so I'm going to do this. <laughs> when I saw my name, I mean, it just, it, I just lost it. You know, to think that, I don't know. <clears throat> that, that was just, it was just mind boggling, just blew me away. I think it was like a reflection of all the years that he put in, you know, the, the family, all of it. When he saw it and he saw his name on the airplane, it all came out. It was great. And probably as emotional as I've ever been in 30 years. You all mean so much to me and, and, and Donna for, for over the years. I'm going to miss you all enormously. And I, I, I hope you realize that. Thanks, Steve. Thanks. Thank you. All my memories are from a dash, and I know a lot of senior flight attendants the same. 10 year, 20 year, 30 year people, that's, that's their plane, it's the dash. To me, it's like the end of an era for a lot of people. Um, we were a dash airline, and now we're not. I'm sad, you know, I see one, I just saw one in the hangar, and I'm like, they're taking pieces off of it. You know, they're taking the seats out. It's, it's kind of sad. It's, it was surreal. Dash was a good airplane. I mean, it, it paid for a lot of things for Henson Piedmont Airlines because it was their bread and butter. You know, the Dash. You know, yeah, it, it was a tank, but it also kept service to communities that would not have had service. I mean, maybe someday those that don't have service right now will get it again. But I'm sure people now are sorry they ever said anything bad about the Dash. I don't know if I'm sad, it's just uh, it's, it's just uh, inevitable because they quit making the airplane as they're, and once you get so far on them, they're done. I, I really don't know what he would think, um, probably just facing progress, you know, as we go along with jets, you know. He, he knew that that was eventually going to come. I am going to truly miss our Piedmont crew. Um, it's just emotional because all this crews are like, this is the last time we're flying here and they're crying and, you know, you build, um, you build these relationships. It's not just an airplane, it's part of your life. It's, it's the friendships that you've developed over the years because of that aircraft. I fly on our airline and I'm very proud most times of what I see as a passenger. I was meeting my mom um, last year in Charlotte and my plane landed and by the time I got down to see, um, she goes, where have you been? It's been like 45 minutes. I said, hey, I can't get through E without seeing a flight attendant or a captain or a for former coworker or former mentor or something. That's the thing that we all could rally around that everyone would, would, oh, it's a Dash 8, right? But we were like, it's a Dash 8, right? So it was, it was a good thing for us.
is kind of our symbol. I think years to come, all these um, young children that have been flying in and out over the years, they're going to come back to Hilton Head. They're going to be like, what happened to the, you know, the Dash 8s? It has to be an end at some time. There always has to be an end. So we're just lucky enough to see it. Yeah, be part of it. Yeah. It was a blast. Yeah, I mean, it, it is. It's, it's been a rare moment.